Good morning. Is the sound traveling? All right, good. It's a beautiful morning, as has been mentioned already, and it's good to be alive in Jesus and uh, to be back together again. Um, hopefully I can see my notes there eventually. Um, again, we had a wonderful time in uh, Swan River, and uh, we... Uh, Enjoyed our time, again, reconnecting with the people there. Uh, we, as you probably know, we uh, pastored there some 13 years, and so there's a lot of memories and a lot of connections and so on. And so uh, our uh, sister-in-law, Doris, and her daughter, they asked if we would be open and having a barbecue when we arrived and together with the church people. And so we had uh, 25 people from the church come out. And, and so it was a wonderful evening of just reconnecting and sharing and catching up and and uh, becoming aware again of what God is doing and has done and so on. And so it was just good to see how leadership was rising up and uh, stepping forward and so on. And with that, I'd also like to just say thank you, Nathan, for sharing the word last, uh, last Sunday. And my sense and what I heard was very good. And so I just want to bless you and affirm you in that. And, and for everybody that's here this morning, just the blessing of God on you. Just as the sun shines on you, may you just feel his warmth, his embrace, his everlasting arms around you. So may that be a reality for you this week as well. Probably a lot of people are out vacationing and at the, you know picnicking or out in the cabin, so we want to bless them as well. Just at their time with Jesus out in the beach or on the lake or in the cabin, good family times would take place. And so, um, yeah, just being together. As it seems like a, a sort of a special privilege this year. Like with the COVID and all, it just seems that being able to connect is just a gift. And it's good for, for people to be together. And so so this week, Connie and I want to be together with our grandchildren and Trevor and Jeannie. And so we'll be going to Hecla. They say, you know, check out Manitoba. So it's, uh, I think it was our ninth anniversary, Connie, that we were there. So that's <coughs> a couple of years ago. So we'll be uh, celebrating our anniversary come on the August 10th. So there'll be fireworks somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, I'd like to just uh, sort of as an announcement, we uh, talked about our prayer time this coming Wednesday. On August the 5th, we'd like to do a prayer walk uh, in its place. And so I was biking in the new development here and just saw the, uh, the number of new homes and houses, new families moving in. And uh, just as I'm biking, I just felt the Lord saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, only the Lord can break into those homes, you know. And so uh, I would invite you, I'd like to invite you for August the 5th, which is a Wednesday, to come and join us in a prayer walk in that uh, community. I'm not sure if we'll be able to cover every street, but very much would like to do so. And maybe more, so, uh, more than once, uh, that we would go more than once. It, it takes time to break through. And so uh, in our ministry over the years, and especially in church plants, this kind of penetrating communities, opening up communities has to be done with prayer. And uh, just to recall as young missionaries in their early 20s, driving into communities and um, driving up and down and just praying and then also walking up and down the streets and just asking God to open up homes or people's lives. And so, yeah, I just feel that that's going to be and has to be part of our mandate here at Oak Bluff Bible Church as well. Uh, next Sunday, Reg, right? We're going to have this picnic lunch? Yes, next next Sunday. And so <laughs> we'll bring your picnic bag and picnic lunch. Just one sandwich will do, and then God will multiply. <laughs> you know. Uh, just enough for yourself and a little bit of sharing as well if you want to. But basically, it's for yourself. So bring for your family. So next Sunday after the church service, and we can use the tent for that as well. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. It's a gift from you, and uh, your mercy is new. It's fresh, invigorating. And the resources of Jesus are here for us. And as we look at your word, may it come alive. Uh, may the things of Jesus become more dear and clear to us. And as Paul says, to know Christ and to make him known. 
And Lord, that is our longing, to get to know you more. Uh, we sing about you and we pray to you, but this is an ongoing development of relationship. It's, it's one that we need to cultivate. And so as we look at this particular passage, Lord, may we not just know about you, but to know you. Um, God, we want to pray for our friends or families that are out at the lake at this time. want to pray that they would just have a meaningful encounter with you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit whether it's through the word or through the uh, just nature itself, the calling of the loon, just they would be reminded of your goodness and of your grace and your salvation. So thank you so much for Oak Bluff. We want to pray for this community. As was mentioned, a lot of people have experienced loss, and so we want to pray for those people that are hurting, those that are struggling with illnesses and disease. God, you're the great physician, and so God, manifest yourself so that you are honored and glorified. So thank you that we can pray and that we can be servants of yours, and we want to be found faithful in doing so. I want to thank you for the people that have set up these tents and uh, just the, you know their faithfulness in coming out in the morning and setting up, and the sound system works. And, and so, Lord, thank you for people who are committed to, to furthering your kingdom, your cause. So bless our time. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we want to continue our study in the book of Philippians, and so chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you or your cell phones, uh, just uh, please turn there, Philippians chapter 3. And uh, there's a couple of words that jumped out at me when I started reading it. One was with placed confidence, where you place your confidence. Uh, rejoice in the Lord was another phrase that caught my attention. And then it uses another uh, word in there that's uh, be careful about those dogs. And that one caught my attention as well. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit in its context and its implication for us as well. So, um, you and I all have met individuals in our life's journey that uh, displayed a tremendous amount of confidence. And they just exuded almost to the point of arrogance, but a sense of pride that was so focused in what they were doing, who they were, and almost uh, there was a sense of snobbishness about them. Chuck Colson, I don't know if you recall him, but in my day, in my sort of early 20s, uh, he was a fairly prominent individual in the Nixon's presidential uh, you know, rulership or t time. And uh, so he was invited to study at Hol uh, Harvard, and he got a scholarship, but, but he, he turned his nose up on that, and he rejected that. And so, or rather, he joined up with the Marines in order to be tough. But while he was there, he set up his own law firm. And so he set up his own law firm and studied sort of on his own and sort of was a self-made man in many ways. And he entered politics, and by age 40, he had become one of President Nixon's closest advisors. And then he described himself as a young, ambitious political lawmaker. He liked to influence the world, and he could throw his weight around, and he was even sort of nicknamed as the hatchet man. And so he could chip at things, and uh, you know, and the trees would come down. And so he was powerful in his own way. And he was, as you know, probably recalling history, he pleaded guilty to being part of the Watergate cover-up, and he was sent to prison, and... Uh, he encountered Jesus, and uh, he had an attitude with the conversion, with the change, that he could serve God, Jesus Christ, just as well in prison as out outside of prison. So wherever the Lord placed him, he says, I'm willing to serve Jesus. And so he says I, you know, that he fought with selfish confidence all his life. As much as he was a follower of Jesus, but he struggled with his superiority in some areas and just his attitude. And he says, and I had to humble myself time and time again. And so I think for us, this kind of ambition, uh, hanging or identity on things. So his was the prowess, his ability to, to rationalize and to think through and to argue his point. And um, maybe it was his background, maybe his money. Uh, some of us, you know, we, the size of our, you know, our ranch, or farm. Uh, a guy out of Texas, he says, you know, it takes three days, you know, to drive around, you know, my 
ranch in Texas. And the owner responded, well, I used to have an old car like that, too. It took me a long time to drive around my car. So in our own mind, sometimes we think our ranch is too big and, and for our own good. And so we hang up, you know, we get hung up on some of our own identities. That, and so my, sometimes it's education, sometimes it's physical or athletic skills. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's just the ability, you know, be it natural talent and whatever. And so God is challenging us, I believe, to, uh, you know, to look to God. So, Bibles open at uh, Philippians chapter 3, and let's jump in there and uh, verse 1. So, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Furthermore, or further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. So it is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is as a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who, by, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself, though I myself... Get knocked over. All right. And so, verse 4, Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Let's say that together. I want to know Christ. And if that is what pulsates through us, we will, we will be world shapers. We will be changers of our communities as well. So I want to know Christ. Yes to know the power of his resurrection. And yes, participation in his sufferings. And yes, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow, through God's grace, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So this is uh, the passage of scripture that is before us, and I'd like to just highlight again some things, again, the importance of the confidence that we place. And so I think uh, for us to make a difference in society and really to live life meaningfully, to have our confidence, as he says, in the Lord. And uh, for 43 times, we find that Paul uses that little phrase, in the Lord, in the New Testament, just in his writings alone. 43 times, he challenges people to see themselves in Christ. And so your identity overarching everything, I am in Christ through faith. And so when that happens, we will uh, again find joy and we will also be able to live a life that's different. Let me just go back to you a little bit in the course of history and starting with Genesis. God's intent was to write his story. And it's called history, his story. And so you have Adam and Eve in the garden, and Eden was known as the place of pleasure or delight. And so God wanted to write a story together with the people that he had created. But Adam and Eve chose to a uh, route of independence. They wanted a life on their own. They wanted to make their own identity. They wanted to place their confidence in something else other than God. Rather than collaborating with God and being part of his story, they wanted to write their own story. And so they rebelled against him. And so as we go through history in the Old Testament, we find that people just were defiant. In chapter 6, we find that 
violence came as a result of it because when people want to be independent and want to make names for themselves, violence happens because my rights want to overlap with your rights. And I want to take your space. And so selfishness expresses itself in greed. And so we have the story of violence. And God says, I'm actually quite sorry about what uh, I've done here. So he sent a flood. And so he went and sent a flood. And then chapter 12, 15, and 17, God introduces a new paradigm. He creates a new people. He starts afresh with Abraham. And he says, you know, I'm going to bless people through you. And your offspring will be, again, my people. And you will then influence all of society, my people. And there was a little symbol or some recognition, a ritual that committed men would go through to be sort of indicators that they were part of God's family, God's people. And it was called circumcision. And so the Jews picked up on that, but along the way, they followed the ceremony, but lost the significance. They would do the circumcision. Boy, at eight, years, uh, eight days of age, automatically got that cut. And so it was part of the ritual, but they lost the significance of why God wanted to write his story through his people and with his people. And so chapter 17, we find the, the introduction of that. And so God today wants to as well uh, have a people group, and he did it through Jesus Christ. Abraham was a forerunner, and uh, Abraham was symbolic of Jesus, and he opened up the way of the journey of faith and so on. And so he was man uh, considered a man of righteousness because of faith. And so that was introduced. And so for us today as well, we're invited to enter into this family of faith through which God wants to write his story. And uh, we are encouraged then to see ourselves in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. And so whatever happens to Jesus Christ, that is, you know, our celebration. And so he says, rejoice in the Lord then. And so uh, whenever things happen and when you approach life, when life is hard or difficult, just recognize the term Lord means he's sovereign. He's got the right to reign. He's in control. He's Señor. He's Lord. And so we recognize that and we by faith claim it. And so even if we do have hot days or cold days, regardless of circumstances, we rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> we, we just, that's our identity. That's our, our fulfillment, our joy. And so this is a particular phrase and word that he uses over and over to the whole sense of rejoicing. So in Philippians 1.18, he says, but that doesn't matter. And he talks about some people that were undermining his ministry. And he says, but that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice. So are we a people of God that rejoice? That there's a sense of joy that is focused in Jesus. And so that is, again, our identity. And so he says, and I will continue to rejoice. So not just Sunday. Sometimes we think Monday is a tough day after Sunday, but I will continue to rejoice. And so this is the invitation that he gives us, that I will continue to rejoice. So God's people who place their confidence in him, whose identity is in Jesus Christ, they are rejoicing people, regardless of circumstances, because Jesus is Lord. Then we find that he says again, uh, verse 26, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. So sometimes we applaud the people that walk across the stage and graduation, and, and, and there's a sense of, uh, we, feel, uh, we feel good. And he says, okay, you Philippian church, looking at me, some of the things that we've been doing and I've been doing, but he says that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. So each one of us can be stimuli 
for the other person in rejoicing in Christ. And so when you see God working in your life, in my life, and so on, collectively we all rejoice in augmenting kind of ways. And so God is encouraging us. And so this is Paul's heartbeat. He sees that. Uh, Philippians 2, 17 says, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And so in this collective mosaic of the church of Jesus Christ, we collectively rejoice with each other's victories. We step in and challenge people, okay, uh, we know that you're going through hard times, but we point you again to the lordship of Jesus. That is, grace is sufficient, so we rejoice together. And then Philippians 2.18, it says, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. And so... Collectively, we celebrate, we rejoice, and are glad. So there's a life lesson for us, I believe, here that Paul learned what every child of God needs to learn. There can be rejoicing in the Lord even when outward circumstances are contrary to a spirit of rejoicing. Even when I don't feel like it and the circumstances don't look like I should, but because Jesus is Lord, we rejoice. And I believe Oak Bluff Bible Church has displayed a lot of that, and I just want to affirm that and applaud that, this, this coming together and applauding each other, celebrating Jesus' victory in and around us. So the Christian's delight really is Jesus. The Christian's delight. So this is who we are. The key to victory is getting our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus. It is God's story, his story, that we are part of. And so even if my story at times looks this way or that way, but ultimately it's God's story. Um, just a little biking tip for you guys. When you bike and your eyes are on the obstacles on the path, you are highly probable to hit that obstacle. You bike where your eyes are focused on. If you over-concentrate on the negatives of life, the wheels <laughs> hit that. Your life goes there. And so when you rejoice in the Lord, that's where your victory is. So you look for your lines, where to go. Look for the lines of your heart and that the lines bring you, as it were, the good path. And so... There were threats to the confidence that Paul displayed, and there was people from the outside. And he says, I have no problem in reminding you of this, this what I've just told you about rejoicing in the Lord. And so it's no trouble to repeat a good story. It's no problem to repeat a good lesson. So that's what parents do with children. And so this is what Paul says. I have no trouble. No problemo. Like, no big deal. I love to get back to the basics of Christian living. And so, spiritual joy depends on your focus. So, if you want to walk in victory, eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. But if you look at exclusively what the enemy is doing and you get swallowed up with the negatives, not that you don't recognize that there's sin, because Paul does that as well. But predominantly, you're walking in victory because Jesus is victorious. You walk in victory because Jesus is victorious. And back in the day, and I think it was 1973, I got a little New Testament. And in the back of it, I'd written in some things. If you look around, we get depressed. You watch the news, it's depressing. Well, you know, when you look at self, sometimes it's disgusting. But when you look at Jesus, it's delightful. And I just remember the day when I wrote that down, and it was a defining time in my spiritual journey because I was finding myself, beating myself up, trying to find 
sufficient goodness so that I would merit God's favor. I would merit God's love. But fix your eyes on Jesus. The author and finisher of your faith. And sometimes I think we get bogged down with life, with ourselves, and we get our eyes off of Jesus. And here was this group then that was harassing the church at Philippi. And they were saying these were Gentile people and they were not circumcised. And the Judaizers, as they were called, this group that seemed to hound Paul wherever he went. They says, you need to add on something. Or even before you can be a believer, you have to be circumcised. It's just no way that God can even look at you before you're circumcised. And so they almost preached, as it were, a gospel of circumcision. And so identity to become a Jew first, and then maybe God will accept you. Maybe Jesus will be enough. And I think there's a lesson for us as well. Sometimes, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And how much more so now that we are saved, he does above and beyond. So walk in that abundance. Rejoice in the Lord. Place your confidence in him. And so these people wanted them to go and do certain kinds of things. And so Paul repeats this message. He had no problem in repeating a vital part of the learning. And so victory over sin is always more successful when looking at the Savior than looking at our sin or at others. And so this is what he was asking us. But he does say, beware. There are things that we need to be cautious of. Look out. And so when there's a, you know, look out sign somewhere, caution and so on, it's, it's good to that. So he talks about dogs. And dogs at that time were not pets. They were like rats. They were seen as scavengers. And so in the streets, they were basically animals that were wild and they were unpredictable and they would go after people and they would nip at their heels and they would bark and they would fight each other and they were indiscriminate in the way they acted, having sex on the street. Uh, they, they were just animals. They were beasts. Well, he is describing now these people doing their ministry as actually not being in touch with God. These people are wild in many ways. And so were they Christians or not, it's hard to say, but they were definitely always trying to pursue Paul and to undermine his ministry, the gospel. And so um, they wanted to then have all the converts that they would be circumcised. And the word um, that he talks about mutilating a little bit later is basic sort of a similar word, idea of cutting. Circumcision is cut around, and to mutilate is to cut down or through. And I'd like to say, so what's the application about this? You know, in our society, we are having and we're finding a lot of people that are actually cutting themselves. To try and get past their feelings, they're feeling numb about life. They're finding themselves disappointed, disconnected, hurting, and they're cutting themselves. And it is in epidemic proportions in so many communities. And I would like to just invite you, if you find yourself in that kind of a mindset or have been, and the enemy wants to continue, that voice of cutting yourself or going in excess of drugs or self-harming is the voice of the dogs. So who are the dogs in your life that are distracting you from following Jesus? Coming to the place where you think you need to do this in order to find satisfaction. Your identity is in Christ. So don't go to the weed to find your identity. Don't go to alcohol to find your identity. Don't go to meth. Don't go anywhere where Jesus won't lead you to. You're a follower of Jesus and follow him. He's the one 
that will give you significance and he's the joy. I've counseled and seen enough people who struggled with bulimia. And it's, it's hard. Anorexia. And so these self-harming kinds of thought patterns, not finding themselves sufficient, and those voices that come, whether it's through the media or just the enemy itself, those are the voices of dogs. That's not the voice of Jesus. So I want to encourage you, seek Jesus. And so it's a constant struggle, you know, to find ourselves in him. That's a repeated kind of reality. And Paul says, come back, come back. But I think also sometimes we literally take a good thing, even devotional life, can become a standard by which we think we are okay, but we really have not seen ourselves in Christ. So I have my daily reading. I know my theology. I've studied. But is that your identity? Is that something that takes precedent? over Christ. And so Paul just comes back in light of all that he'd done and studied and he says, I want to know Christ. I want to have my identity in Christ. Not saying that devotions are bad, but sometimes we get the ritual ahead of the significance. Same as the circumcision. It can be a good thing. And so sometimes in our counseling and our mentoring, then we ask the question, so how's your devotional life? Well, I'm reading five chapters a day. But have you, are you meeting Jesus? Or do you feel good? It's a check mark. You know, that actually I feel good now that I've read something. <laughs> you hear? It's a subtle thing. The enemy wants to have us do the ritual and losing the significance of why we do certain things. And so it can be going to Mass. It can be having the Santa Cena, the Lord's Supper. But we lose sight of the significance. And so this is what Paul is calling us to. So it's a constant struggle. And so actions over worship. And I think that's a, a healthy balance in that. The Lord wants us to worship and to have faith, but faith without works is dead. But you have to have faith in Jesus in order that the actions, the works, Amount to something in God's eyes. So Colossians 2, Paul says vir virtually the same thing. So let no one judge you in food or drink. Colossians 2. Or regarding to festivals or new moons or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come. And so the rituals, the, the, the things that we do are sort of shadows of really of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so let's enter in into that embrace with Jesus to know Christ. So we might know a fair bit about Jesus, but the question is, do you know Jesus? We can sing the songs, and we can be up front here. We can sing songs about Jesus, but do I know Jesus? And that's the invite. And so not holding uh, fast to the head, uh, Paul says, which is Christ, you know, where we get nourished and we get knit together and so on. So... If Christ died uh, and you died with Christ from the basic principles of this world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to its regulations of not touching or not tasting or do not handle this or that? And so sometimes that becomes almost our religion. So Paul criticized the Judaizers because they looked at Christianity sort of from the back. They didn't look from head on and saw Jesus first. So sometimes when people look at Opluff or a church, they look at, you know, the structures, the programs, and so on. But what we want to display is Jesus. We want to live out Jesus, not programs. We want to incarnate Jesus in the community. Uh, and one of my little biking excursions in, in Swan, I came out of the park, and there was a, a gentleman, a, a friend from the church, and he was talking to another a person, and he was from Ontario, and long, straggly beard. And um, it says, remember these little things, think no evil, and then in, say no evil, and then there was the third one, uh, uh, whatever. But he had left out the word no. Think evil, say evil. And I says, what are you doing, sir? 
Like this was his approach. He says, I think you need to just pencil in with, you know, and put the word no in there. You'll be a happier man. And so we were able to share Christ with him, actually. And he asked some very good questions. And he says, I don't believe in the church. Well, he says, let's start first, then let's start with God. Let's start with God. And if you want to know God, then Jesus is the best way because Jesus came down to earth and he lived among people. And if you want to know God, get to know Jesus. And then it says the church is actually just the people that are followers of Christ. It's not the building. It's not the program. And so he had, you know, uh, been very suicidal. And I could see on his arms he was a cutter. And I could see that that man was very, very fragile. He had been a mess. And um, so the Lord brought him into my path. And so we shared, you know, a good block of time with him together with Don, a good friend of mine. So who are the Judaizers in our day? And I think I've alluded to some of that. But I think there's uh, the dogs in a lot of ways is what's coming down through the media. A lot of harassment towards following Jesus Christ is something that is done publicly as far as tolerance and acceptance. And so it's watering down the significance of the personhood of Jesus Christ. And so the church, friends, believers are under attack. Uh, and I just want to, again, reiterate what Paul says. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord. And so true circumcision, as he says here, is really one of purity of holiness. And so he says we are the circumcision. Verse 3, we're going to push on, just mention here, number one, there's something that we who are the circumcision. And so we are made pure and holy. We get purified through Jesus. That's circumcision, purity of heart. So we who serve and worship God by his spirit. That's the other expression. It's interesting the translations have taken different runs at that. So the spirit of God as the object of our worship, or we could also say the worship is of God and done in the spirit, is another approach that we could look at. Or the third option and some manuscripts who just worship in spirit. But in either case, the idea is of zeroing in on God. And so we who worship God in spirit is there. So rejoice in the Lord is another identity piece. And then again, to have absolutely no confidence in the flesh. So Paul has an impressive list of credentials, which he talks about. I don't think he was anti what he had as a backdrop. Like, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I grew up in southern Manitoba. I'm happy for my upbringing. I'm happy for my brothers and sisters. Uh, I, I, I appreciate my parents for the upbringing. But in comparison to Jesus Christ, they don't have a chance. <laughs> All of that in comparison to Jesus Christ and what he offers us, my identity is in him, not the fact that I grew up in Rolls North. That's not my trump card. My driver's license might give me an address that I'm 123 St. Mary's Road, but my ultimate address is Jesus Christ. That's my identity. He is my rock. He is my Savior. And I live to get to know him and make him known. And that's the invite that Paul gives us. God is inviting us. So true believers, and then in verse 7 says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider as a mathematician or a guy that does accounting. So some of you know the penny counting. So I now consider, and he looks at this, and he says, that goes there. And then he looks at this, looks at that. And so I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. We as leadership here at Oak Bluff have not arrived. Sometimes people think that I as a pastor or the leadership, they are just way beyond approach. <laughs> no. We are on this journey just like you are in getting to know the Savior and more and in depth 
and understanding. And so we are in this journey of getting to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. There's always more. There's always more to knowing about the Savior, his forgiveness, his power. And he talks about that. And so he mentions three things in the fact that he looked at. First and foremost is this relationship. And the walking with Jesus, walking in step with the Spirit, that relational dynamic. And then he talks about the power. And then being able to minister and being able to serve, to having victory over things. And so he says that's the second piece, the second level of knowing the Savior. And then lastly, he ends up and he says, and somehow identify with Christ's crucifixion. Remember the passion of Christ, that movie? And so what he is talking about, the passion of Christ, being willing to die to self so as to live with Christ in eternity, in the present. And so those three things is what I would invite you to encourage you as we walk into the week as well. So this ongoing pursuit, this lifelong yearning to gain and to grow and to know Jesus Christ. And so... Just in closing, I would like to just ask again and reiterating, so what are some of the dog issues that you're facing? The things that are keeping you back from really growing or are distractions in your faith journey. I mentioned the fact of some people mutilating themselves and so on and cutting themselves and other things, but I think there are all kinds of relationships that we can enter into as well that are not healthy. Relationships and that are actually undermining our expression of Jesus Christ. And so this it causes for a disconnect with Jesus. And so that vibrant relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, sometimes we uh, water it down by just showing up in church. But he wants a relationship that's meaningful, uh, doing religious things. And those can be sort of rationalizations, the dogs speaking to us. I'm okay because I'm religious. I'm doing stuff. But Jesus wants us to have a living, dynamic relationship with him. So is Jesus king of your life? And that was what God was asking in Genesis 1, that God would be God, God enough, big enough present. He wanted to walk with Adam and Eve. He wants to walk with you and me. So this new inpouring of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Spirit within, are we open to that? Allowing the Spirit of God to come and change us. And when we find that there's little idols in my life that I'm hanging on to, that I'm willing to say, no, Jesus is Lord. I rejoice in the Lord, not in that little idol. And sometimes it's our cell phone. Sometimes it's the things that we watch or listen to. And so God is asking us so to get past those and to grow. So is Jesus' story really important for us? And I think that's the invite to hear. We need to do a heart check. I think we should do it on a regular basis. Is Jesus really and honestly Lord? Let's pray. If you sense this uh, morning that uh, God has spoken to you and you realize that there are little idols, the dogs are speaking in your mind, whether it's greed or materialism, pornography, um, you know, just the bent of your heart is away from God, I would like to invite you just to surrender that to him. It's through faith. And anybody who thinks he stands, be careful, lest you fall. So our confidence is not in our past or upbringing, but it's in Jesus. So, Lord, if there are people here that are struggling with certain issues, we all do. And that's why Paul says it's no problem reminding us of that again. So as we go through this week, may we be conscious and cognizant of our own heart and allow the Holy Spirit to have access to our thinking, to our imagination. God, just come in and move in and have your way. Help us to recognize when the dogs are barking, when the dogs are nipping, and again, to be wise at those moments. So, Lord, thank you again for this group, and bless them and keep them, and may your smile be on them, and may you caress them 
and keep them from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and thine is the glory. Amen.